Speaking of Courage podcast, we are back in a hot studio. What's up, bro? It is very hot. It is, man. How you been? Pretty good, you? Same, same. Same, same, man. What do we got going on today? Uh, doing a World War II one. Yeah. Is that you? Yep, that's uh, me. <laughs> doing a World War II. We're going with uh, cold weather here today, so we're going to do that's a, a, cool a, a winter cool. episode. Yeah, it's not bad. It's kinda, What's it made of? stylish. It's wool. Yeah. Thick wool as most of that stuff. What's was. the material that kills in the cold? What do you mean? They say like when you go out in a cold temperature, there's a certain fabric that you're not supposed to wear. Is no, it cotton? I'm not sure. I wouldn't Cotton know. kills? Or, there's some phrase for hunters that say, but it must not be wool. <laughs> Wool's pretty warm. Uh, it, can, it can keep you warm but when yeah. it gets wet and everything. But, I mean, it's, it's very itchy and it's miserable as well. So. Okay. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not Gore-Tex or anything like that. What's Gore-Tex? Gore-Tex is like the waterproof stuff we wear now. Oh, like, okay. Uh, there's like the... Um, so what I wore when I was in the army, it, the stuff that stuff. makes the water beat off. Exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's not it's not going to be anything like that. But it's it's good for what it is. But you know, yeah, times being what they were, they didn't have Gore Tex. So World like War Two. Yep, World War Two. U.S. Army again. I've never seen the jackets. It's cool. Yeah, this is like the, the dress jacket, but the, you'll see them. We're doing the Battle of the Bulge today, which we're going to get into. Okay. But you'll see these kind, and then you'll see kind of more the traditional field coats, like Brambo War. They, those were introduced in 1945-ish. Yeah. So you'll see some of those. You'll see a mix. A lot of the Bulge pictures you're going to see, people just layering up. They look like they'll have any type of hood they can find on. They'll freezing. have scarves. They'll have everything. Yeah, below zero temperature is just miserable. Ugh. So, any, so anything you can get on, you're going to get on. Heck yeah, man. Yeah. Ugh. Below freezing? Below freezing, oh, yeah. God. That seems to be a common theme on a lot of these. Yeah, things, you know? <laughs> like, can't we, just, yeah. can't we just fight when it's warm? Exactly. <laughs> you can, but it'll be in the jungle and you'll be rotting. So yeah. you, get one, you get one extreme or the other. It's usually not convenient. I just got back from fight. Costa Rica, yeah, and yeah. the first thing Tiff and Jen and I thought when we got out, we landed in Costa Rica, we get out of the airport. As soon as we go out the door, we all three were like, dude, this is the, the, like the Vietnam episodes. Yeah. It. Dude, it hits you literally like a ton of bricks. Right. It's miserable, man. And that's in board shorts and a tank exactly. top. Exactly. And you're not carrying gear and doing what you're and told. And getting bit, dude. We right. went on all kinds of excursions, mosquitoes, bugs, shit everywhere, dude. Yeah. Not cool. Yeah, so minus, got a little minus, taste of that. Minus the enemy. Yeah. All right, uh, so who's our hero? All today? right, so today we're doing a gentleman by the name of William Adolf Soderman. Kind of an unfortunate middle name there, but uh, William Soderman. That sucks. Yeah. Well, he's... he's uh, not going to be one of those well-known again either. And doing research for this, there's not a whole lot of that out there that, okay. that's known about him. But again, he's one of these guys that are in the Medal of Honor in World War II, and most people don't know his name. Yeah. We'll call him William Soderman or Bill, as, as other people called him. We'll skip that middle name. But yeah. prior to... You think he got made fun of for that? Uh, during the time, I'm sure he did. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, prior to Adolf Hitler, that was not a common name, but you'll see it fairly often. He yeah. kind of ruined the name for good for everybody. But and the mustache. Exactly. Yeah. Charlie Chaplin was angry about him yeah. uh, ruining the mustache. He was born in uh, West Haven, Connecticut in 1912. So he's a little bit older for the World War II generation yeah. as well. So William Soderman's going to be of Swedish descent, and he's yeah. going to live in uh, kind of a tight-knit Swedish community. So okay. as with most emig immigrant communities in the U.S., it's going to be be, you know, like Mexican communities where you're surrounded by that culture. It's going to be the same with the Swedish people. So in his community, they're going to kind of raise up as a community. So he's going to be, everybody's going to kind of know each other. So it's going to be a fairly good lifestyle. And he's going to have a little bit of childhood before the depression kicks in, because okay. like I said, he's older. He was born in 1912. So he actually ended up going uh, to high school and playing football for three years. He was a big kid. A lot bigger than a lot of these guys that we usually profile. We tend to do the small guys. Yeah, a lot of times they're small. Yeah, he was about six foot tall, so he was a big... He was huge for He them. was Swedish, so he's a big Viking Nordic-type Nordic, yeah. Nordic type fellow there. But uh, And he was a meat cutter, so you can kind of get an idea <laughs> of, of what kind of person he was. When he actually joined, his enlistment paperwork said farm work, and then it was scratched out, and it actually said the Federal Packing Company, which because he was cutting meat. So. Okay. Big, six-foot-tall, Nordic-type, Viking-looking uh, yeah. uh, uh, meat cutter or butcher, if you will. There's not a whole lot uh, ab known about him prior to entering the war. There's not a lot of information, but we do know that he was married. He married his wife, Virginia, prior to actually joining World War II or joining the Army. In the, so he's in married. The, does he have kids? He, uh, prior to joining, he did not. Um, so he's... Again, 1912 and then 1941 is when the war starts. So if you want to do the math there, yeah. for it. Um, he's he's going to be a little bit older, but he's going to be, compared to these younger guys that we, we see a lot and that we profile a lot, he's going to have a bit of a life going already before that. But as with everybody else, he's going to be suffering from the times. He's going to be living through that Great Depression. He's going to be, you know, seeing the country change and he's going to see war on the horizon. 
in December 7th, 1941, just like everybody else, he's going to be reeling from that attack and they're going to be having that patriotic fervor to join. Because of the way the draft system was set up, though, he actually didn't end up joining until 1943. So he's going to join in the Army in August of 1943. So this is A couple be, years later. Correct. After Pearl Harbor, this is going to be after Guadalcanal, after those initial defeats. We're already, you know, getting ready to invade Fortress Europe. Um, in the Pacific, we're moving forward. So it's going to be a little bit later. And like I said, his enlistment paperwork said he was six foot tall and 200 pounds. So that's a big dude compared to the Audie Murphys that are 112 pounds or the uh, Douglas Monroes that are 140 pounds. He's six foot 200 pounds. So he's a big dude. Big. And he was 31 years old uh, when he actually joined. So he's, like I said, going through, Much older, right? going through basic at 31 has got to be a challenge. Yeah. When I went through basic, I was 18. There was some, definitely some older guys there, and you, you, you kind of had to feel for them because, one, it was physically harder. You know, you sleep wrong when you're 30, and it's not yeah. going to feel good. And two, the menial BS is kind of more menial to them because he's been, he's, he's had a, he has a wife. You know, yeah. he's been holding down a steady job for years. Not as and easy now to get yelled at. Yeah, now you're getting yelled at by these young guys and, and having to do stupid tasks and watching other people that can't pack their bunks and stuff. So that's got to be a little bit difficult. But he's going to be going through the same training everybody else is. He's going to go to basic training. He's going to go to his infantry school. And then he's going to end up being part of the 2nd Infantry Division in the 9th Infantry Regiment, which is the uh, Manchus. There's still a famous regiment out there today. I, I have a good amount of friends that were merman shoes. They're very proud of that. So he's going to be one of those those guys with the big Indian head patch on his yep. shoulder and the um, uh, the Manchu belt buckle, the dragon, and everything like that. So possibly because of his size, but like we talk about with these guys, they're going to get assigned different weapons. They're going to have different things that are going to kind of. Uh, direct their fate. So Machine Soderman, he, well, he was actually assigned as a bazooka man in this oh, one. Okay. For whatever reason, they always give the bazooka or the machine gun to the littlest guy. Don't ask me why. Yeah. That happened with me. That happened with everybody. But they actually, he became an infantryman and then he was the bazooka man. So a bazooka is exactly what you think it is, right? It's a big long tube that shoots a big explosive out or a big yeah. rocket. So like I said, possibly because of his size or possibly because of skill or for whatever reason, he ended up becoming a bazooka man. And a bazooka is a cool thing if you think about it, right? But it's insanely dangerous, too. It's a two-man team. The way it works, you have your loader and you have your, your, your bazooka man, your firer. So the main guy is going to, um, you know, you're going to sit out in front and you're basically going to be exposed aiming that and controlling it while the, yeah. while the loader is going to load that rocket in the back, connect the wires and tap you on the head and you're going to fire thing about a bazooka is, is you're going to be a huge target. It's going to have a huge flash. You have to sit there. So once you fire that rocket at whatever you're shooting at, whether it's a tank or a building or people, you're going to be the biggest target, right? So it's, it's a very, very dangerous job. And it's max effective range, they say, is between 150 meters to 400 meters. But you have to get real close to be effective. So it's not necessarily the job you want to have, but yeah. it's going to be very effective. And, and you don't have any defense against right. small arms. You, yeah, you, you have your, your loader there. Maybe can go to guns quickly, but not as much as you would like, right? Because yeah. you're going to be out there holding that big long tube and you have to hold it steady to aim it. So it's going to be a very, very difficult thing. So he's going to do his train up. And again, this is a time of big mobilization. This is 1943. We're fighting in Italy. We're still fighting uh, in, in the Pacific. We're fighting all over Europe, but we're getting ready for that big push to Europe. So he's going to be sent along with the 2nd Infantry Division, and then he's going to be sent to Europe with everybody else. Now, the 2nd Infantry Division actually landed on D-Day plus two. So right after the initial landings, two days later, they landed and they joined that, that big push towards Germany. Okay. I'm not sure when Soderman himself actually joined the unit, so I don't know if he was with the initial landing or if he got there later, but eventually he's going to become part of the unit and he's going to be pushing towards this trudge towards Germany. Now, we've talked about D-Day a couple times on here, and we've talked about you know the follow-up and everything, but essentially... This is our, this is on the Western front. This is our push into mainland Europe. This is our, we're driving through France and the Germans are essentially on the, on the retreat, right? For the first time we're in the heartland and we're pushing towards Germany and they're fighting, fighting this fallback. So it's going to be a very tough time because the Germans don't retreat haphazardly. Yeah. Like we said, right? They're going to hold positions. So very he's strategic. going to be, exactly. He's going to be a part of this. They're going to be dealing with all those things everybody else is dealing with, outrunning their own supply lines. You know, you're carrying all your equipment on your back. You're carrying your food. There's going to be sporadic uh, attacks. You're going to be moving from position to position. You're going to be chasing the Germans until you run up against a wall or whatever that may be. So as his job as a bazooka man, he's going to be there with that bazooka. So he's going to be getting, getting indoctrinated into this combat just like all these other guys are going to be. And like I said, you're going to need 
nerves of steel, essentially, to be his bazooka man, though. Because yeah. with the rifle, you can get down as low as you want. You can take cover. You can fire. You can run. Fire, you can move. Down. A bazooka man, you pretty much have to almost be in the open or behind a decent cover, but you have to have enough to have your back blast area clear. You have to have a yeah. field of fire in front of you. So you just you have to have nerves of steel, but the, everybody's going to be depending on you because we've talked about this before as well. When you're in the infantry you're carrying the weapons you have. You have rifles, you have machine guns, you have grenades, you have uh, possibly mortars if you're mortar men. Those aren't going to stop a tank, right? Yeah. Your rifle's not going to go through a building. So your bazooka man is your only hope against a tank. If an armored attack comes towards you, you can call an artillery or you're going to need your bazooka man. Or you're the just bazooka be, will take the tank out? If you hit it in the right spot, a yeah. bazooka can take a tank out. But that's another huge thing, right? You have to hit it in the exact... Uh, perfect spots or it's just going to bounce right off and then you're going to be sitting there with the muzzle flash in the open like you know the guy that just slapped yeah. Mike Tyson because they're going to be able to turn around and, and yeah. come at you so but the guys are going to be depending on you while you're doing this so you have to be good and and the other thing about these bazookas is they're they're finicky just like every other weapon right they can misfire they can malfunction if they're dirty the round can explode in the tube and cause you kill you or your partner if the wires aren't connecting properly there's all kinds of things that can happen that can make this bazooka either misfire and you're out in the open or explode and kill you so it's a very very dangerous uh, position and it's a very important position when everything's working perfect you're in a lot of shit. When everything's not working, you're, you're even more so. So yeah. that's going to be what Soderman's dealing with. But being 31 years old, I imagine that he's going to have a little bit more responsibility than some of the younger guys, and, and this is going to be a task that he's going to be able to, to accomplish. In July of 18, 1944, Soderman and his unit were on the road to St. Lo in France, and they actually came across the tank. So this is going to be their first opportunity to actually show their mettle and show kind of what the bazooka men were able to do. And Soderman and, and his uh, loader, they actually single-handedly were able to knock out a tank. So there's bazooka men all over Europe, but not all of them are actually going to get a kill. They were actually able to score a kill and take out that tank. So nice. Soderman in 1944 showing his proficiency with that weapon, and he's showing that his men can count on him, right? Destroying a tank is a, is a huge feat. Think about what that means. I mean, you see it in the Ukraine right now and everything. Or yeah. Sorry, you see it in Ukraine right now. But a tank is capable of, of killing vehicles. It you know, can destroy bro ri bridges, roads. It can do all kinds of things. It's, it's a terrifying, lumbering beast. Have you ever seen a tank in real life? No. Even like at a... I mean, I've seen like one that's parked or whatever. Right. Now imagine them moving... Think of like a big, big diesel truck or something coming at you and you're there with your hands. What are you going to do to stop this yeah. thing? So the idea of a soldier or two with, with just one weapon being able to take these out is, is huge, right? And he was able to do that. So that's, that's going to be one of those crazy feats that that's almost hard to imagine but it's happening all over europe at this time yeah. right there's the whole lines are pushing forward and fortunately the germans although they're fighting a, a strong resistance they're falling back they're they're we're winning the war at this point we're yeah. pushing them back so this is going to be one of those those uh tiny tiny moments in this bigger grander war but the war doesn't stop when you take out a tank so they're going to keep pushing forward they're going to keep moving right the goal is to basically get to Berlin and knock out the Germans so we can all go home. Soderman and these guys are going to keep pushing until they're going to get to the Battle of the Bulge. Have you ever heard of the Battle yeah, of the yeah. Bulge? Okay. So what the Battle of the Bulge was, was kind of the Germans' last offensive, right? So from June to December of 1944, we were on the offensive. We were winning. The problem with that is we're running out of fuel. Our guys are getting tired. We're getting more and more spread out. We're getting our line is, is extended, right? And because we were almost victims of our own success in some ways because as we're pushing forward, instead of, you know, I mean, I'm super overgeneralizing here, but instead of having to keep tight, it's, you know, we can maybe spread out a little bit more. We can have these gaps in our holes. Right. We can have, because the Germans are falling back. There's no way they can fight us. You know, they're fighting the Russians on the east and that's going poorly. It, they're still fighting in Italy. We, we got them on the run. What we didn't know was the Germans were mounting this final counterattack. The Germans were going to make their, their last big push, and that's what the Battle of the Bulge was. And it ended up lasting from December 16th to January 25th. Jesus. That's a 228,000 Allied soldiers took part. That was us and, you know, on our side versus 406,000 Germans. Damn. 406,000 Germans. So the Germans were actually secretly pulling troops off the Eastern Front to push. They were going to push through, try to break our lines and separate our units, try to capture the port of Antwerp, going to get these fuels at, at a minimum, try to get us to the bargaining table, but on a maximum, you know, basically push us back and, and, and take back what we had been doing since June 6, 1944. Who's the general at this point? 
the American, there's all kinds of generals yeah, but on the American side. Yeah, there's not like a specific one. Well, Eisenhower's the Supreme Allied Commander, and then you have um, uh, Bernard Montgomery as the the um, the British general, and Patton's in charge of the Third Army. We have all kinds of generals. A bunch but of dudes that don't want to go to the negotiating table, though. Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, we've we've sacrificed enough men and lives at this point that we're there's not. No. Yeah, the only acceptable victory is supreme victory, is is uh, complete victory, right? Yeah. By the end of the Battle of the Bulge, 19,000 American soldiers were killed in action. 19,000. 47,000 were wounded in action, and 23,000 were missing in action or taken POW. It was a huge disaster, depending on how you calculate it. It was one of the biggest battles in American history, one of the largest surrenders in American history. It was just a massive, massive surprise and a massive blow. The reason it's called it the Bulge is you think of the line in our battle. The Germans pushed through and caused this major bulge in our lines oh, because okay. they were able to pound through so far. It was just... And we Completely surrendered. unexpected. A lot of our troops did. Yeah. Just backed off the lines and went running? A lot of our troops were brand new and had never seen combat. A lot of these guys were replacements, right? So we were taking some of our combat fatigue guys off the line and putting these new guys up. The 106th Infantry Division got overran. A lot of these uh, young, young kids, and they're telling them, you know, the war's over, you know, you guys are just, you know, go man the foxholes, I know it's cold, whatever. They're not expecting a big fight, they're expecting the Germans to be retreating. And then the combat f fatigue guys, they might have been fighting for years, they're thinking, it's December 16th, it's almost Christmas, right? They're yeah. thinking about home, they're writing home. the letters, exactly. Thinking, this will be my last holiday away from home, Yeah, we're going to make it. You know, they're daring to hope at this point because the Germans are falling back. They're miserable because they're freezing, but they're, they're, they're finally, we're seeing success. Since June 6th, the Germans have been running, right? We got them licked, essentially, is yeah. what they're thinking. So nobody expected this. So when the Germans came crashing across our lines with superior firepower, superior numbers, superior skill, and the initiative, and, the, you know, a lot of our guys fought and were killed. A lot of our guys fell back and were killed. Um, they're, they're, it, was just, it was just a giant disaster, right? Damn. So on December 17th, 1944, which is, you know, the early days of the Battle of the Bulge, Soderman was a 33-year-old private first class. And he had been in the Army about a year and a half, a year and five months, right? Which is not a lot of time. Yeah. But he's been in combat for several months. So combat's kind of those, a month in combat's worth a year in training almost, yeah. you know, especially if you're an experienced bazooka man who's actually taken out a tank. But the Germans are going to be crashing through, this, through our lines, and Soderman's going to be there with his bazooka, and all these other guys are going to be there. His, his mission was to defend a key road junction near uh, Rocheroth, Belgium, I believe it's pronounced. So that's going to be kind of their, their mission ob objective. But the Germans attacked so fast that all of our plans essentially fell apart. The German tanks are streaming through our lines. Like I said, our ga there's so many gaps, or such large gaps in our lines that we're getting confused. We don't know where our guys are, where their guys are. There's Germans running around wearing American clothes, turning signs around and doing, you know. Damn. Just, yeah, so then we're not trusting our own guys. There's chaos everywhere. You can't see. The Germans specifically waited for the weather to be bad, so our air support couldn't protect us, so our guys are on the ground or not knowing what's going on. Damn. You have rookie lieutenants and everything, so nobody can communicate. So it's just, it's just chaos. And we have sub-zero temperatures, like I said. This is one of the worst winters in European history in a long, long period of time, of course, that happens to coincide with this. So we have guys who are already suffering from wounds. We have guys who are suffering now from frostbite. We have guys that are suffering from battle fatigue. And the Germans attacked so fast that we weren't able to get our casualties out of there. So we have all these wounded and dead, and the Germans are coming through. Soderman being, again, an older guy who's taken responsibility, he actually volunteered to stay back with the wounded while the men retreated. So our line, our guys are trying to figure out what to do. We have to get the hell out of here so we don't collapse. Not just because we don't want to be taken prisoner, but if we all lose, the wars, are, you know, we have, yeah. to, we have to fight. We have to get out of here. But if they're wounded, we're there. So Soderman actually said, I'll stay back here so the, Germ so the Germans don't execute our, tro execute our troops. I'll stay back and try to surrender to them so we can get a fair uh, treatment for our troops. And fortunately, his Kyre command said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going we're gonna to fall back. Have you ever heard of the uh, Malmody Massacre? Uh -uh. So this is one of those things that was going on. The uh, Malmody Massacre was on December 17th. The Germans captured, I believe it was troops of the 106th uh, Infantry Division, the, who surrendered, and they lined them all up in the woods. And uh, after they you know, were patting, down, patting them down and the Americans were thinking, okay, we're going to be prisoner of wars now, they, they executed 84 American soldiers just killed them in cold blood. So Damn. these were the kinds of things that were going on in the so Battle of the So rumors are going around. So rumors are going around. Again, there's chaos and confusion, but Soderman was still volunteering to stay back. So it kind of shows you what kind of guy he was. Yeah. He's going to be the kind of guy that's going to risk his life 
for his partners. And again, for these younger guys that are probably 10, 15, younger than, yeah. 15 years younger than him in some cases. He feels responsible. Yeah. Exactly. As they're falling back, though, think of the big picture. When I say they're falling back, I'm saying the whole American fall, uh, line is falling back. German artillery is going to start pounding them. They can't catch us to, up to us with our troops, so they're just cutting us to pieces with the artillery. Uh, we've talked about artillery before, but if you've never seen, I think the best example of it is on uh, Band of Brothers when they're in, yep. in the Battle of the Bulge. Just the ground shaking. Trees are going to be exploding. The shells are going to be hitting the ground. The ground's going to be shaking. That shrapnel is going to be coming up. It's going to be raining down on you. People are going to be screaming. There's you chaos. Where it's landing. You can't hear. There's nothing you can do to hide, especially if you're not dug in. The trees are going to be exploding, right? And the trees are going to be shrapnel too. So those are going to be hitting you. And 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 it's it's just chaos and it's fear. And that's where you get things like shell shock and World War yeah. One because it's just so loud and it's so intense. You can get killed from the concussion. You don't even have to get killed by an actual shell or piece of shrapnel. You can just get killed by the concussion. But this is going to be terrifying. And then after the artillery would subside, the Germans would attack with armor or infantry. So again, imagine if you're a new troop, if you've only been in the Army six months, six months ago you might have been a far, on a farm back in the mm-hmm. United States, and now you're fa- facing German tanks. And, and the German Germans infantry. are on their last leg. Exactly. Dude. So and they're, they're fighting with a fervor that we haven't seen. They're defending their homeland, yeah, essentially. We're, different. we're in Belgium right now, but they're getting close to the homeland. They know it's the last hurrah. And they know exactly what this means. So they're fighting ferociously, and our guys are just on the defensive. I, I've said it a thousand times, but having the initiative is a huge thing. When you're just reacting to them attacking you, it's a very dangerous thing when they have the plan. They're already yep. organized. You're reeling from an artillery attack. You look up and you're getting overrun. So you can either try to fight, you can die, or you can surrender. And if more you talented surrender, fighters get beat by absolutely. berserkers all the time. Absolutely, you know, there's no calm or, or steadiness if someone doesn't agree to the rules of war. Right, like oh, we're gonna feel each other out, mm-hmm. and one guy just goes, "No, I'm gonna kill you." And it's once you get caught with, that, with that first blow, yes. it's gonna be very, very hard to recover. recover. And that's what the bulge was. Yeah. In one of these artillery attacks, Soderman's actual uh, assistant gunner, as we would call him in the machine gun world, but his loader was actually wounded. So what that did was that meant that Soderman was now by himself. So instead of having to sit there with his bazooka on his back and have someone load it, he's going to have to load it himself, put it up, and set the wires and everything. So it's just going to make everything even, even more complicated, right? Damn. But this is what the bulge was. This is happening all up and down the line. So the Americans keep retreating and treating and retreating and we're falling back and we're trying to get to safety and we're trying to communicate with the other units and we're trying to make a line. So while we're doing this, everyone's bracing for an attack, right? We're, they're, they're trying to dig in. They're trying to fall back. Soderman decides he doesn't feel like waiting around to get attacked. So he's going to go on the offensive himself. So while everyone else is following back, Soderman decides to grab his bazooka, grab as many rockets as he can, and he's going to grab his bags. And he's going to move forward in front of the American lines to go out and meet the Germans. Not a squad or a platoon. Just him. Just Soderman. He decides, I can do something about this. I'm going to go stop them, right? So I'm going to actually go out and fight the Germans myself while I, to give everybody else a chance to fall back. And you have to kind of consider it that way. Anybody with common sense knows this. This is an armored advance that's coming at you. You're screwed. You're, you're going to die. But he's going to delay them, right, long enough because he knows he's got the skill with his bazooka and he knows he's got the courage. So he's going to go ahead and do that. So Soderman's going to grab as much as he can carry. He's going to grab his, uh, you know, a couple of these grenades. He's going to grab his M1 carbine. He's going to sling all his bags and he's going to take his bazooka and he's going to move off into the woods in the coming darkness. Now, don't forget that it's freezing cold too, right? And he's, he's moving off. He, the only way he has a chance is to use stealth and surprise. So the thing about a bazooka is, like I said, it has the ability to take out a tank. A tank can easily destroy you. They have their big guns. They also have machine guns. And then they have the, the infantry that's going to be around them. Tanks don't like to advance without infantry, though, because they don't know if a bazooka hits them. They don't know if there's 30 people out there waiting or one or two. So if you have that element of surprise, you're going to be able to be somewhat effective. But once you fire, that flash is going to give you away, right? Yeah. So Soderman comes up with a plan. His plan essentially is he's going to lay on the road all night beside this narrow road in kind of like a hedgerow, and he's going to wait for the tanks. And when he sees or he hears the tanks, he's going to jump out, run directly in front of the tanks, and try to fire that, that bazooka into where the ammo compartment is, and then try to sprint back into the woods before anybody sees him, right? Yeah. It sounds kind of simple, but it also sounds ridiculous. Right? Yeah. I'm literally, I'll just, I'll just lay down here, and hopefully nobody sees me. But by doing this, if he can get one tank, he can potentially block that road, and that's going to be able to give them, uh, give the rest of his unit time to withdraw. They need to get about four miles back to the rest of them, right? So he knows that 
If he doesn't do anything, all these guys are eventually going to get captured or overrun. If they're lucky, they'll be POWs. If they're, if they're not, they're going to be massacred. So he decides to wait it out. So he does just that. Soderman finds a, like I said, a ditch on the side of the road near a hedgerow, and he lays in there all night. So think about how cold that would be. Anybody that we were talking about hunting earlier, if you've ever hunted, you know that the ground is just going to suck that, that warmth right out of you. Yeah. So he's going to be laying in a ditch. You're going to have to be flexing your toes and your fingers below sub-zero temperatures in World War II wool clothing, just trying to, trying to do everything you can not to freeze to death, oh, essentially, God. right? Miserable. You're going to be wet. You're going to be cold. Scared. That ice is going to be on you. Time's going to be just ticking slowly. Your bones are going to be aching. You're going to be, you're going to be physically shaking the whole time from, from the cold and from the fear you're probably hungry as well because you can only think about so much food it's a couple days till christmas you're probably thinking about home but for hours he's going to lay in that ditch every every minute he's laying there though that's that's more steps that his guys are getting to the rear and that's more more feet that the germans are coming closer yeah. right so every time every every hour that he lays there shaking his guys are making it further away and he's going to leave himself out there to be that that blocking that shield he's going to be all by himself Nerves of steel is the only thing I can think of, which yeah. comes with being a bazooka man. He doesn't even have a loader, though, which even if he did, it might be hard to convince him, hey, let's, let's go yeah. out here by ourselves. But eventually, sometime during the night, he started to hear the rumble of the tanks, and it ended up being five German tanks are going to be coming down this road. And the Germans are moving so fast, they're actually coming down the road. They're not concerned with the Americans, right? They're actually bypassing American units to get to the bigger picture, trying to get to these other tanks, trying to destroy our units. But he's going to be hearing these rumbling of the tanks. And now it's kind of like go time, right? Like if you've ever been in a fight and you're planning it yeah. all day, once you finally get there and you're like, crap, it's the point of no yeah. return, right? You hear <laughs> those rumbling of the tanks. Now he's going to have to get up and do something about it. But if you shoot too quick, you're going to miss, right? If you expose yourself too quick, you're going to get cut down. If you wait too long, you're not going to have a chance. If you try to run, you're going to get killed, right? So he has to wait for the exact time to be able to do this. Again, meanwhile, in the rear, the Americans are falling back, and there was actually a rear position. There were some Amer an American officers with binoculars, and they're looking down the road, not knowing Soderman's there, and they're seeing these five German tanks coming up the road, and they're thinking, you know, this is it. Here, our guys need to brace for an attack because it's, it's only going to be a matter of time before these panzers reach us. And once they do, our guys are going to have to fight for their lives, and they don't have anything to defend them. Yeah. But they didn't know Soderman was there. So as these guys with the binoculars are watching, they see these five German tanks coming up the road, and then they see Soderman jump up out of the ditch, do exactly what he said he was going to do. He's going to run directly in front of the tanks. He's going to crouch down 15 feet from the first tank, and he's going to fire his bazooka. And one of the actual uh, guys with the binoculars actually said, that guy must be nuts. And as he said that, Soderman fired, and the tank exploded into a, an enormous fireball, which actually killed the crew, incinerated the crew, and stopped that lead tank. Cool. Soderman was as good as his plan, though. He sprinted back into the woods, and the Germans weren't able to see him. So they're driving along, and they're going to see, you know, they're, they're looking for Americans, and all of a sudden this guy pops out, and before they know what's going on, their, their tanks exploded. By his audacity and his courage, he was able to actually stop that tank, right? And the Americans are able to get further away while these tanks are blocked. And there was one military historian, Private, I'm sorry, uh, William Cavanaugh, who later wrote, Private, Private Soderman had just begun his private war. So now Soderman, after he's killed this tank and he's blocked this road, he's going to move to cover, and the other German tanks are actually going to speed around that tank. They, they're, they're temporarily blocked, but they're going to keep going. So Soderman decides, I'm going to move back to my position. I'm going to do this again. I, ma I made it once. Let me see if I can do it again. So he's going to remain there the rest of the night. So you just killed that one tank. We talk about this a lot on the show, that adrenaline dump, right? You literally face down a giant armored beast. You face down five of them. You blew up one, and you were able to stop this thing. How long is your luck going to last, though, yeah. right? So he's laying on the side of the road again. He's got to be drenched with sweat from the and adrenaline. And the other four are coming? The other four actually bypassed, and they were destroyed later on okay. by other uh, vehicles and everything. But there's more and more Germans streaming into these lines, chasing our Americans down. So he's going to be having to try to get them. So the enemy doesn't know he, where he's at, but they knew that that tank was destroyed. So now they're trying to dislodge him. So while he's laying there, the Germans from behind are, are streaming artillery into his unit. They're, they're launching mortars. They're shooting machine guns into the wood. So now he's spending the rest of the night laying there, facing oh, artillery crap. attack, facing mortar attack, facing machine gun fire. But he's by himself, too. You know, it, There's a little bit of comfort of being around your friends, and there's, it's got to be just terrifying laying by there. Yourself. But but this 33-year-old guy, right, he's just laying there waiting for the next onslaught. And... and Again, the cold is just what I always think of, your feet. And, and after being wet from the sweat and running around, yeah. 
it would have been very reasonable for him, and he would have been a hero if he went back to the lines, if he caught up to the Americans, hey, I killed a tank, yeah. and, and been good. But he remained at his post all night under this severe artillery, mortar, and machine gun fire waiting for the next onslaught. And the next morning, he's going to be completely exhausted because there's no way you sleep through that. Yeah. And the last you know, week, you've been moving, so it's going to be very difficult. But shortly after dawn, five more tanks roll into a view. Once again, these tanks are coming down this road, and once again, Soderman's laying there. You got to just be, you know, like like waiting for that oh. opportunity. A good way to think, you know, uh, Don Quixote. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's what I kind of think of, like charging the windmill or char- or, a, or a knight charging a dragon or something yeah. like that. Just this one little guy with the with the bazooka fighting these tanks. Five tanks, mind you, for the second time. So once again, Soderman's actually, as the tanks are coming, he runs up towards the ditch. He's running alongside the ditch where they can't see him, and he's getting as close as he can. And once the tanks were close enough, when he was about 50 meters away, he's going to leap out of the road into the full view, and he's going to fire into the tank again, and he's going to kill that first tank, and he's going to uh, disable that, that lead tank there. This time, the tanks weren't able to get around the road, so he effectively blocked the road by killing the second tank, and these other tankers out of fear of other infantrymen or fear of an ambush or whatever that may be, they're actually going to fall back and fall away. So Soderman's going to sprint off into the woods again. Damn. Once again, stopping a tank. On his way back this time, he actually encountered a, tr- uh, a German infantry platoon, which is bad news, right? Because Soderman's by himself. A platoon is multiple guys, depending yeah. on, on how they're describing it. But they have rifles, they have carbines, they have machine guns. He's got his bazooka. So smart thing to do would probably be to fall, hide, maybe run, get down, do what you want to do. But Soderman's goal is to stop these Germans as long as he can. So Soderman's going to take his bazooka and he's going to aim it at this German infantry platoon and he's going to fire directly into the platoon and he's going to kill at least five of them and he's going to cause the other ones to retreat because they don't know what's hitting them. All yeah. they know is that you don't use bazookas against people generally, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, or a group target of individuals. So he just killed a second tank of this encounter and now he's going to fire directly into these infantrymen and these infantrymen are going to retreat. But now he knows his position is no longer uh, defendable because now the infantry is coming. So he's actually going to sprint back to the American lines. But because of his actions, he was able to get his unit to be able to fall all the way back to an assembly area where they were able to recover their wounded and they were able to consolidate. He had protected his unit by killing two tanks and, and by killing these, these, um, these infantrymen, right? Yeah, God knows how that slowed it exactly. down. Exactly. And, and, and again, the big thing is the Germans don't know how many people are out there. All they know is they're taking heavy fire on these wood lines. They're yeah. taking, every time we go through here, our tanks are getting killed. They don't know if there's mines. They Could don't be know if there's... people. Exactly. They don't, they don't know if it's this crack unit. They don't know that it's just one crazy guy. But courage and audacity and, and the willingness to do it allowed him to protect his guys. So he's going to go back to the assembly area, and he's going to finally lay down to rest his head, right? As he does so, he's laying there. He's probably going to get some food. He's probably going to re-equip. He's going to get some more rockets. They start to hear word that there's another armored attack coming, right? They start to hear those tank trouble treads running again, rumbling again. So Soderman decides, I've been lucky so far. So Soderman's going to grab his gear again, and he's going to go back on a one-man assault against the German armored column, essentially. And his superiors are just letting him do it? <laughs> There's so much chaos on these lines he's right now. He's probably just getting away with it. Yeah, he, he's probably not reporting to anyone, anyone. He's probably in a special weapon squad, and half the guys are wounded. Yeah. So he's loading up and moving towards the front. Nobody's going to stop you. Yeah. So he's going to load as many rockets as he can, and once again, he's going to move forward to confront these iron beasts, essentially, right? So this time... He's going to move along that, that road just like he had before. And as he reaches the iron column, he's going to do exactly what he had. He jumps out in front, and as he shoots his last rocket into the lead tank, he once again destroys that tank. So this is the he's third getting pretty good tank. At it. He's getting pretty good. But unfortunately, the Germans were a little better this time. So as he fires that rocket and that tank explodes, the other tanks are going to open up, and they're going to stitch him up with machine guns. So before he was able to get to safety of the wood line, he's going to get struck multiple times by machine gun fire, and he's going to go down in those woods. And the machine gun fire is going to rip through his upper chest and right shoulder, so he's going to be bleeding from, from profusely from that. He's going to be alone, and he's not going to have any, any, you know, any medical aid, anything else. His right arm was fractured, and blood started to spurt out. It's freezing cold when you have all this gear on, too. That was one of the problems with the bulge. You can't really treat yourself because you can't get to those wounds because yeah. you can't tear open that clothing. So he's going to just be just pulsating that and nobody blood. nobody even knows he's there. No one knows he's there. No one's going to be able to get to him. He's a mile away from the lines, essentially. So he's just going to kind of lay there, feeling those fractures, feeling that cold, feeling himself bleed out. And he's going to start to, you know, just like anybody else that's been grievously wounded, you're going to start to lose that feeling in your legs, and he's not going to be able to walk. He's not going to be able to move. The Germans are going to be trying to retreat or move past or whatever they're going to do. So by now, he has no weapons. He has nothing. But 
he decides that he doesn't want to die. So he has that will to survive. So he actually started crawling back along the ditch line. So with his fractured, uh, his fractured bones and with those, those grievous wounds and with those multiple machine gun pullets, he started to crawl back and drag himself back to the American lines. And he actually was able to crawl back for over a mile and they were able to track his, uh, his line shit. of uh, blood loss. So he ended up actually making it and he actually survived wow. after killing three tanks and multiple infantrymen. And because of his actions, like I said before, the Americans were actually able to retreat and get to a defensible position, and we were able to stop Damn. stop this attack. So by effectively blocking the, the two roads with the tanks he disabled, his actions that morning likely saved the lives of hundreds of American soldiers, right? And this is one of those examples of a forgotten action of the Battle of the Bulge and what a, what a guy with yeah. a bazooka and courage can do him. His one-man engagement with the German panzers lasted over 16 hours, 16 hours, he single-handedly confronted three separate attacks of armored columns of five tanks, right? He jumped out in front of these guys and these infantry. A witness later said, at no time during our two days with him did Private Soderman show fear, but was always grim and determined in his efforts to halt the enemy tank. All throughout this battle, Private Soderman displayed a heroism that far exceeded the deeds of an ordinary soldier. If it was not for his cool and courageous acts, we are certain that our entire unit would have been overrun. After a week of intense round-the-clock fighting in just this area, the Army lost 5,000 men killed or missing, making, making it one of the costliest um, uh, battles in American history and U.S. Army history. Damn. But if it wasn't for guys like Soderman, though, it would have been much, much, much worse, right? And his actions that day actually greatly contributed to the defense of this area. They were supposed to be holding that crossroads, like I said, and he was able to complete his mission and do that. After the war, when they were actually studying the Battle of the Bulge, the Germans had broke through at every point, except for this area. And German General Hasso von Manteuffel stated, we failed because our right flank ran its head against a wall. And that wall was Soderman. That wall was one single person. The Germans in their own accounts actually were, were looking at it and saying, you know, we broke through here, we broke through here. What stopped us here? And that was one single bazooka man and named uh, William crazy. Soderman who was able to survive. In the end of the battle, again, of the Battle of the Bulge, we had 89,000 casualties, including 19,000 killed. So you can imagine what would have happened if... That's 15 tanks that he stopped, right? He killed three of them. But 15 tanks, if those tanks would have went through, think about what those big guns on the tanks, think about what those machine guns on the tanks, think about yeah. the infantrymen behind those tanks would have been able to do to our guys, especially those fresh troops who hadn't seen combat, who didn't know what was going on, who were going to be... And what that inspired in the guys exactly. that were behind. Exactly. Those guys that are able to make it back and they're seeing that there is hope and there is a point to fight. Rather, That dude's a badass. If, if you see... All those Germans coming at you that effective, it's going to be easy to throw your rifle down. Yeah. And just, I don't want any part of that. But if you see somebody successfully defending against them, you Quietly might go, alone. you know what? Yeah, maybe I can grab my rifle, right? Yep. And those first nerves of, of like first combat, you're going to lose your small motor movement. It's going to be hard to load that, that clip into the Garand and everything. That's going to give you time to get over that and to, to get back in the fight. So those small scale actions are going to be those huge yeah. butterfly effect essentially on that. The Battle of the Bulls was pivotal. Right. If the Germans had crashed through, who knows what would have happened if they would have made it to Antwerp. Would they have won the war? Probably not. Would they have been able to push us off? It's hard to say, right? But it would have definitely delayed the war even longer. Yeah. Could have cost thousands of lives, right? It could have changed the shape of Europe yeah, after all those the war. Pivotal things, man, right. Lead to more battles. Even the Cold War later, it could have been catastrophic what could have happened. But there was guys like Soderman all over these lines fighting their one man uh, battles and refusing to give an inch of ground. And because they did that, we were able to win that battle and, and many other battles. And we were able to keep pushing towards Germany. Man. So fortunately for his efforts, Soderman actually received the Medal of Honor on November 1st, 1945 from uh, President Truman. And then he survived to, to live a I don't want to say a long life because he died at uh, 68 years old, but he did. He lived a, a, a good life. He returned home to his wife and he married and I'm sorry, uh, he returned home to his wife and he had two children and he spent the rest of his life working at the VA like a lot of these other guys yep. do, staying in that, that, that service um, <clears throat> field, continuing to serve the other guys. Yeah. I'm going to read his citation Go here. We've been, we've been skipping these a little yeah. bit on, on some of these, but it's good to have them in. So this is the citation of William Soderman. Armed with a bazooka, he defended a key road junction near Rocheroth, Belgium, on 17 December 1944, during the German Ardennes counteroffensive. After a heavy artillery barrage had wounded and forced the withdrawal of his assistant, he heard enemy tanks approaching the position where he calmly waited in the gathering darkness of early evening until five Mark V tanks, which made up the hostile force, were within point-blank range. 
He then stood up, completely disregarding the firepower that could be brought upon him, and launched a rocket into the lead tank, setting it afire and forcing its crew to abandon it as the other tanks pressed on before Soderman could reload. The daring bazooka man remained at his post all night under severe artillery, mortar, and machine gun fire, awaiting the next onslaught, which was made shortly after dawn by five more tanks. Running along the ditch to meet them, he reached an advantageous point and there leaped to the road in full view of the tank gunners, deliberately aimed his weapon and disabled the lead tank. The other vehicles, thwarted by a deep ditch in their attempt to go around the crippled machine, withdrew. While returning to his post, PFC Soderman, braving heavy fire to an attack a heavy infantry, I'm sorry, an enemy infantry platoon from close range, killed at least three Germans and wounded several others with a round from his bazooka. By this time, enemy pressure had made Company K's position untenable. Orders were issued for withdrawal to an assembly area where Soderman was located once he, orders were issued for withdrawal to an assembly area where Soderman was located when he once more heard enemy tanks approaching. Knowing that elements of the company had not completed their disengaging maneuver and were consequently extremely vulnerable to an armored attack, he hurried from comparatively safe position to meet the tanks. Once more, he disabled the lead tanks with a single rocket, his last. But before he could reach cover, machine gun bullets from the tank ripped into his right shoulder. Unarmed and seriously wounded, he dragged himself along a ditch to the American lines and was evacuated. Through his unfaltering courage against overwhelming odds, Soderman contributed in a great measure to the defense of Rosharath, exhibiting superlative degree the intrepidity and heroism with, Ameri with, with which American soldiers met and smashed the savage power of the last German offensive. That's amazing. Pretty well written there. Yeah. Citation. Somebody had a fluency of language yeah. in that one a little bit. Yeah, those, those battles are a trip because Germ say, say the Germans get through there. Now it motivates those soldiers. Right. Oh, whoa, we just did that. Now, you know what I mean? Like, a, like it and becomes like an avalanche of right. confidence one way or the other. And it's so hard to react because, like I said, we're so spread out. If they do breach a single point, where, which lines do we bring in? Which, what troops do you have to consolidate and plug the, plug yeah. the holes, right? If you ever played like Risk or any of those games yeah. when you're trying to you know, move your troops around... Okay, so they they smash through through this particular area. I can't take troops to defend that area because we have to. We don't know if they're going to attack in the south or, or or on these other lines or whatever. You know. Yeah. So you you have to make those decisions. Do we hold our ground here? Do we go over there? How much fuel do you have? Right. There's there's the logistical element too. I can't send these troops. These troops have been on the line for 45 days. They're going to get there and they're going to get slaughtered. Or, 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 or we don't have you know we're combat ineffective or what have you. So yeah. there's a lot of bigger picture things. Courage, man, can change the whole. Yeah, one one outcome. man with courage makes a majority. This yes. was literally this was literally one guy. Like again, Audie Murphy's too holding the line, or some of these others. A lot of these actions, they're going to be units that are going to be inspiring each other. But this is one guy, and this is. It'd, it'd be interesting to ask him, you know, what he thought, because he might have just been thought he was doing his job. I'm yeah. the bazooka man. I need to go. Because yeah. again, when he's in Did the he rear, realize what he was doing. Yeah, when after the second time when he's in the rear, he might have thought, well, you know, why would you send the rifleman up? They can't do anything. I'll do it. Or did he realize, you know? Or was he having fun with it? Like, let me, I bet <laughs> right. you there was some of that too. He might have like, had some confidence being that being a yeah. six foot tall, two hundred pound guy in tanks that time. Easy, yeah, you know? he might have been been you know just knocking people out his whole life too. Though, yeah. just, <laughs> never never lost anything. Yeah. So he might have. Uh, but it's it's really hard to say. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of interviews with him, and his story's not super well known. So How it was a little possible? hard doing the research, right? God, that drives me crazy. Especially, These guys just like retire to. Nothing on record. Mm -hmm. How is that even possible? How do people retire not retire to obscurity and just live a good life? I mean, which is fine, right. but it's like, how do these guys not get hunted down and yeah. just like do on the record interviews? You think every Veterans Day they'd be, you know, yes. all over the place? A lot of them, more of them are now. You know, their stories are a lot more being told even yeah. since Vietnam and everything. But uh, but yeah, it, there's there's so many. I mean. World War One and Civil War, their citations are one or two lines, and, and we'll never know what they did because yeah. they weren't recorded anywhere well, yeah. you know, unless it makes you can me get the crazy, man. Record. Yeah, trust me, it makes me... <laughs> right. And then you have Mark Wahlberg walking the red carpet. <laughs> Nothing against Mark Wahlberg, right, but it's right. like, why... This, there's guys like this in real life. There's family members that don't know what their grandpas did, you know, well, we've, that are we've actually heard from family, you know, that, that, recipients. That yeah. haven't heard as detailed of a description of what their family member did. Yeah. Man. And again, I've been doing a real bad job on these lately, rushing through them, but it's just, 
if you can imagine the extremities, we've talked about this a hundred times. If you take away the combat element and just put someone out there in a survival show or something, if you watch alone, you know, think about digging a hole in the cold, hard ground in the Ardennes forest in Belgium. Think about trying to dig in how exhausting that is and how, how freezing cold that is. And then when you get there to have to lay in there all night, right? Well, and you're, like you're peeing I, like I in the helmet you. and throwing it over the I side. I was just in Costa Rica and the co- went on a bunch of hiking trails through the freaking Costa Rican jungle. And dude, I'm, I swear to you, I couldn't even imagine being there right. overnight. I'm not, I'm mm-hmm. not joking. Like the stuff that was crawling, there's animals exactly. everywhere. There's yeah. monkeys everywhere. There's snakes. Mm-hmm. And, and you always talk about how there's animals and I didn't realize how lush, <laughs> dude, I was seeing it every, you see everything everywhere. Did it's, you smell the jungle? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. 100%. And it's sludge. Mm-hmm. It's like, uh, the ground isn't ground. Right. It's, it's like it's, sludge. It's, it's all the foliage everything that's is rotting soaked. and everything. Yeah. Everything's wet. It rains constantly and then it dries and rains right. and dries. But underneath the canopy is mm-hmm. just constantly wet. Yeah. And dude, the animals are everywhere. Yes. And this is now. Mm-hmm. So you can only imagine almost a hundred years ago. Right. So tr- my, trying to pull guard and listening to those things too and your mind playing tricks on you and all that. Uh, and it's loud, the night. man. Yeah. The jungle is like deafening. Mm-hmm. It was crazy, man. It was like a crazy learning experience to be out in that area yeah. it was cool you should have you should have took some video i do i have okay. video yeah. yeah i should have gave you a helmet to wear around so you could run around it in the woods crazy, or something man. like that how but, hot how just miserably mm-hmm. hot it was and it can go from rain to sun to all that it did every day like that. yeah every day i mean we were at a nice resort and we went out right to go on these excursions and stuff but you're never going to be completely dry you're never going to be comfortable dude, no. you when your feet are wet again you're walking a t-shirt through water. was too much to wear right i'm not joking mm-hmm. like that it was just miserable and now on the floor flip side when we have belgium and germany and france and things the you're you, st- you step in a puddle and your feet are wet they're not gonna dry it's yep. the same thing because you're trudging forward and if your boots start to wear down or if something goes wrong you have all those things when you're digging if you hurt your thumb and now your thumb's messed up you have to fight with that thumb right and there's parasites everywhere and exactly like, dude it was and it you was have to crazy. keep your weapons clean and you have to yeah. keep your, your weapon dry and all that you know so you have to keep your bazooka wires intact or, or however whichever model of bazooka yeah, that, he had that trip gave me a whole new view on vietnam dude, yeah. because literally you go you go too. three four feet off the trail and you can't see the person right exactly it's That's that another thick thing. now imagine the chaos of combat and, yeah. and fighting and seeing those and then i was kept thinking as i'm on this hiking trail like imagine the people that live there mm-hmm. how the advantage that they oh, have yeah. is just on like i always knew that we always talk about that but when you're actually in the jungle, you go, mm. holy crap. Like, right. It's so disorienting like to be in there and like know where you are. Where You know what I mean? And as compared to somebody that's familiar exactly. with it, dude, it's such a huge advantage. Yep. So good, good story. All right. So that's the story of William Soderman. Uh, on the Instagram, I put up a post. Uh, give us suggestions for names for our mannequin. I got a few if you guys want to comment on this video as well. I got a couple, uh, couple different ideas people had up there. Let's see what you guys got. Any other suggestions for or ideas for episodes if whether it's a person you want to hear about or a time period or a war or a branch of service you know you want to hear more marines or you want to hear more air force let me know family members Mm -hmm. any family members of people that we've highlighted email us message us we'd love to hear from you too absolutely we're going to try to do some more interviews again too in between these are going to be once a month on the uh, recipient stories we're going to try to do some supplementary stuff in there as well so let us know if there's anything specific you want to see on that like i said talking about weapons talking about uh you know equipment going over the uniforms whatever that may be let us know we'd like to uh, do whatever you guys are interested in so cool once again thanks for listening all right